Hey everybody, Trey here, and welcome to this first installment of what's going to be a series of videos on how to read SKU T's and photographs. Uh, I've gotten a lot of feedback from some of my recent videos, um, saying from people saying, "Oh, the SKU T stuff was kind of over my head. I don't really know how to read a SKU T. They're pretty complicated, etc." And I've gotten some requests from people uh, also asking me to do a video or two explaining how to read skew tees and photographs, and that's exactly what we're going to do in this series. Uh, we're going to start out with uh, skew tees. In this, in this video, we'll look at just what all those lines mean on the diagram, and then in subsequent videos, we'll take a look at how skew tees are actually made, what all those derived parameters mean, and how they're calculated. And finally, we'll take a look at some skew, different skew tees in different environments and kind of compare and contrast them. And then at the end of the series, we'll take a look at photographs, how they're made, and how different photographs can modulate the kind of severe, severe weather hazards you might see for a given event or the char characteristics of supercells in a given environment. Um, skew tees and photographs are some of the most important things you can use when you're making a forecast and, and if you know how to use them properly you will be a much better forecaster whether you are an operational meteorologist making a forecast or you're a storm chaser picking out a good storm chase target if you know how to read and use skew tees and photographs effectively you are going to be a much better forecaster because they give they can give so much information on a given environment and how that environment has changed over time that if you don't know how to read skew tees and photographs and use them effectively, you're going to be at a disadvantage. Um, so let's get started here. Quick word on the kind of the history of skew tees. They were invented in the late 1940s. Uh, at the time, there were a few different um, thermodynamic diagrams in use. For example, the tephagram and the emigram. But at the, at the time, the U.S. Air Force was coming up with new analysis and forecast techniques. And the skew T was invented to kind of make uh, those techniques easier to employ. And they did, and it's become kind of the staple thermodynamic diagram for meteorologists, at least in the United States, um, in the last what, 70, 70 some odd years since the skew T was invented. All right, so let's get this full screen here and let's dive in to just what each of these lines mean. Now, if you're just looking at this diagram for the first time, you're new to meteorology, and you're looking at a skew T for the first time, it can be quite intimidating. Um, the there's a just it looks like a jumble of lines, and when I, when I first started looking at skew T's, it was confusing as well. But once you get the hang of it, and once you know what each of these lines mean, they do have a specific purpose. It'll become a lot easier to decipher what a skew T actually is showing. Um, and it's, it's, in the end, it's, it's fairly simple. It looks intimidating, but um, we're going to help you get the hang of it here with this video series. So let's start with the, um, the x-axis here. So the x-axis, and this will give us a clue as to why the diagram is named skew t log p. The x-axis is our temperature axis. Uh, it is in degrees Celsius, and they are represented by these diagonal lines uh, that run from bottom left to top right of the diagram. These solid diagonal lines here, those are our temperature lines, or our isotherms. And the reason it's called a skew T is because the temperature lines are skewed at 45 degrees from the vertical. Um, for whatever reason, it allowed the analysis techniques back in the 40s to become a lot easier to use, and so therefore the diagram is called a skew-t diagram because the temperature lines are skewed. Now once again, it is in, they're all in degrees Celsius, so keep that in mind. You can see the values here along the x-axis as well. All right, now let's take a look at our y-axis here. Let me switch colors. All right, so then our y-axis is our pressure axis. And you, of course the name of the diagram is a skew t log p diagram. And that is because pressure decreases as you go up in the atmosphere in a logarithmic fashion. Um, these horizontal lines here are called isobars, or lines of equal pressure. And you'll notice near to the surface, the distance between these isobars 
is a lot closer, a lot less than it is uh, um, versus up higher in the atmosphere where the spacing is a little bit greater. That's because pressure decreases logarithmically with height. So if it was a linear decrease where pressure decreased the same amount from isobar to isobar, then we would see these the spacing remain the same as you went higher up in the atmosphere. But that's not the case. Pressure decreases logarithmically with height, and therefore we have our skew t, skew temperature lines, log p, uh, the logarithm, logarithmic scale of pressure here on the y-axis, and of course the pressure is given in millibars. And one quick note, you know, if, you, if someone told you how high up is, you know, 400 millibars, um, you wouldn't be able to, you know, say that off the top of your head, most likely. So a lot of soundings will have this, uh, some sort of scale showing a conversion to feet or even kilometers. The SBC soundings, which we'll take a look at, um, have a, um, some measurements in kilometers above sea level. And this particular sounding has it in feet, and you can see the values here um, on the right side. So just something to make uh, deciphering how high up a certain level is. Uh, you have pressure on the y-axis, but you can also have it in feet here as well. All right, next I'm going to clear this just for to save some space here to make it a little cleaner. So next we'll talk about these dashed lines that run diagonal as well from basically bottom left to top right of the diagram and these are our mixing ratio lines and the mixing ratio which is denoted in shorthand by the variable w in meteorology the mixing ratio is going to be the mass of water vapor in grams over per kilogram of dry air so you might think that huh, those units are kind of unintuitive, which it would be grams per kilogram. And it's kind of weird to have a mass unit over a mass unit, but that's just the way it is in meteor when we talk about the mixing ratio here. It's the amount of grams or the mass of water vapor per kilogram of dry air. So quick kind of example to help you visualize here. If we had one kilogram of dry air here, and for every one kilogram, say in an air parcel, or an imaginary box of air. Here's our one kilogram of dry air. We had five grams of moist air. So we have five grams of water vapor per one kilogram of dry air. So our mixing ratio would be five grams per kilogram. That's basically all the mixing ratio is. It's an absolute measure of the moisture in an air parcel. And again, they're denoted by these dashed lines that run diagonal from the bottom left to the top right of the diagram. All right, now this is where it can get a little bit confusing. Um, I'm going to change colors here just to make it a little bit more visible. So these last two lines on the diagram may be kind of the most important lines here. and Maybe not important so much as they can be confusing, but they're pretty critical when we're trying to evaluate the instability in the atmosphere from a skew-t. So we'll start off with these curved lines that go from the top, sort of top left of the diagram, and they curve down here toward kind of the bottom right of the diagram. These are called the dry adiabats. Now you might be thinking, what the heck is an adiabat? Well, there are two different kinds of processes really that we talk about in meteorology. There's, there's diabatic and then there's adiabatic processes. And in an adiabatic process, there is no heat added or lost to the system during that process. And really the main, the thing we're talking about here is the rising and sinking of air which results in the warming and cooling of air parcels. So if you have a parcel near the surface, if it's pushed upward and it goes upward, it's going to expand. It's going to become bigger. And that we can also have that happen in the opposite fashion where you have a parcel of air that starts aloft, it's pushed downward, as it sinks, it's going to compress. Now, when an air parcel rises, it expands, and through that expansion, it cools. That's an adiabatic process. Just because it, it is expanding, the parcel or the box of air expands, 
it cools. And as a parcel is pushed downward from a loft toward lower levels, um, the parcel com gets compressed and it warms. Those are adiabatic processes. And when we're talking about the our dry adiabats here, these represent the dry adiabatic lapse rate, which I'll kind of abbreviate as dry DALR here. The dry adiabatic lapse rate is 9.8 degrees Celsius per kilometer. And what that's basically saying is when you have a dry parcel of air, when it is unsaturated, so we'll say we have a box of air, it has no moisture in it whatsoever. It's going to rise and it's going to cool at a rate of 9.8 degrees Celsius per kilometer. So for every kilometer this dry parcel of air goes up, it's going to drop in temperature 9.8 degrees Celsius. Now let me clear this and show you these dashed curve lines that kind of go, sorry, a little bit off the line there, but you can see it's these kind of curved dashed lines here that go kind of from the bottom of the diagram and kind of go up towards the top right of the diagram. These are our moist adiabats. And the moist adiabats simply represent a saturated air parcel's ascent through the atmosphere. So when we have a box of air, and let's say this time it's full of water vapor, it's completely saturated. It's going to rise, but it's not going to rise and, and decrease in temperature as it expands at the same rate as a completely dry parcel of air. Near the surface, and the moist adiabatic lapse rate uh, near the surface, so we'll just say the MALR for, for short. Near the surface, it's usually about 4 degrees Celsius per kilometer. But the moist adiabatic lapse rate depends on the amount of water vapor that is in a given air parcel. So it, it changes as you go up in the atmosphere. And a simple you know, tenet of meteorology is that colder air holds less moisture than warmer air. And we know that as we go up in the atmosphere, the temperature decreases. So air, as the, a, a saturated parcel rises, all of that moisture is going to get squeezed out. And you'll notice here that in the upper portion of the atmosphere, our moist adiabats and our dry adiabats are almost parallel. Well, that's because the moist adiabatic lapse rate up in, here in the atmosphere in the higher portions of the atmosphere begins to be very similar to the dry adiabatic lapse rate, 9.8 degrees Celsius per kilometer. As all that moisture is squeezed out, it continues to rise in the upper portion of the atmosphere kind of as a, an unsaturated parcel. So that's what those curved lines mean. You have your, your moist adiabats, or these curved lines here. They are your moist adiabats and they represent saturated parcel ascent. And again, the, uh, the rate of cooling of a parcel as it expands and uh, ascends in the atmosphere differs based on the amount of moisture in that parcel. Whereas these curved lines here, these curved solid lines, those are your dry adiabats, and they represent that 9.8 degrees Celsius per kilometer value, which is the dry adiabatic lapse rate. And you know, often in meteorology, you're never really going to see a parcel that rises the dry adiabatic lapse rate, although it can happen, which is uh, we would call, it can actually go uh, decrease at a greater amount than the dry adiabatic lapse rate, which is what we call super adiabatic, uh, but that's for a different video. But generally you're going to see something between this moist adiabatic lapse rate and this dry adiabatic lapse rate. And again, we'll show you how to use these lines when making a sounding in the next video. But for now, that's pretty much what all these lines mean. So in summary, you've got your temperature lines, those these solid lines here that go from bottom left to top right. Those are your temperature lines, T for temperature. Actually, I'll write it out here just to make it a little more clear. So those are your temperature lines or isotherms. These horizontal lines are your uh, pressure contours or isobars, again, skew T, the temperature lines are skewed at 45 degrees from the vertical, and your pressure lines, log P, the pressure scale is logarithmic as it goes up in the atmosphere, decreases logarithmically as, it, as you ascend in the atmosphere. Then you have your mixing ratio lines, I'll do green for moisture here, these diagonal lines here 
are your mixing ratio lines, or for short, W. And again, that's just the mass of, of water vapor per kilogram of dry air within a parcel. And then you have your adiabats, your dry adiabats here, these solid curved lines that go down from the top right to the bottom, uh, excuse me, the top left to the bottom right of the diagram. Those are your dry adiabats, and again, they represent that dry adiabatic lapse rate or unsaturated or dry parcel ascent, uh, which is that uh, 9.8 degrees Celsius per kilometer. And then you have your moist adiabats, these dashed curved lines. Those are your moist adiabats, and they represent saturated parcel ascent. So a parcel of air that is full of water vapor. And again, that moist adiabatic lapse rate changes as you go up in the atmosphere based on the amount of water vapor that you have in your parcel. So let's take a look now at an observed sound. We've gone kind of through the foundation of the skew T diagram. We've got the, 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 what all the lines mean on kind of the foundation, the grid. Now, what about an observed sounding? So let's start with the red and green lines here. And of course, we'll do an actual sounding and show you how this sounding is made in the upcoming video. But let's go ahead for now, just you know, decipher what these actually mean. The red line is the environmental temperature, which I'll abbreviate ENV for environmental. Environmental temperature. And the green line here is the environmental dew point. So these are both observed profiles from the instrument pack on the weather balloon. As that weather balloon goes up, it uh, sort of radios back uh, atmospheric data from, from every different level of the atmosphere. A bunch of different levels of the atmosphere are plotted, and then you get these profiles. The red line is the environmental temperature. The green line is the environmental dew point. So these are actual, actual observed profiles of the actual atmosphere. This brown line, however, is the parcel temperature or the parcel profile. And there are a few different ways to do that. Again, we'll do kind of go through that in the upcoming videos. But it's basically the temperature of a hypothetical parcel of air if it were to be pushed upward in this environment. Now, usually, if we're just doing this on our own, we're making our own sounding, usually we'd, we'd uh, you know, start at the surface. And you'll notice here that the, in the kind of lower levels, the parcel profile follows the dry adiabat. And then once it gets saturated, once it hits, uh, once the mixing ratio line touches the parcel profile, then it, uh, it, the parcel is then saturated and it rises following the moist adiabat. We'll talk about that again in detail in the upcoming videos, but just wanted to give you a kind of baseline of what each of these lines mean on an observed sounding. So that's all I've got for this first video. You've kind of got the baseline of what the lines on the sounding mean. Next video, we'll put it all together. We'll actually make our own sounding and see how a sounding, a skew T is actually made. Uh, and how we can get from the raw data to something like this. So that's all I've got for now. We'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.